Messi. Oh, what a goal it is! Hello everyone and welcome again to another episode of the Bola Bola Show. We thank you for your time. On today's episode, we would like to discuss further with Dato Dr. Ramlan Aziz on the recent situation about Christian Eriksen and cardiac arrest suffered by footballers out there. For your information, Dr. Ramlan is a very experienced sports physician and he was the head of the National Sports Council and the National Sports Institute here in Malaysia. We do have another part where we interviewed Dr. Ramlan on his illustrious career. So do check us out on that episode as well to get to know more about Dr. Ramlan. As for today's episode, if you're wondering what's the difference between a heart attack and a cardiac arrest, well, you have come to the right place. Over here, we break down the incident that happened to Christian Eriksen as well as we try to understand what saved his life and how others can be saved too. So here we go, guys. Please do enjoy this episode of The Bola Bola Show. So welcome back everyone. Dr. Ramlan, you know, the footballing world was shocked on the second day of the Euros, you know, when Christian Eriksen suffered a cardiac arrest on the field, you know, being just a 29-year-old athlete at mm. the prime of his health, you know, many fans like us out here are asking, you know, how can this kind of things, how can such things happen, you know, is it something hereditary or, you know, what, mm. what, what could have happened there, Doc? Yeah. Well, um, there's so many things that can happen, actually. All right, mm -hmm. and um, the most important thing was was uh, when you have an incident like this, it's most important to to react quickly. All right, um, no time should be wasted because for every um, minute that that we delay in yeah. giving rendering uh, first aid and then help to to the player. Uh, the, the chances of survival will reduce by about 7 to 10 percent. Okay? Mm. Many studies mm -hmm. have done this. Every mm -hmm. minute. Every minute. So, you know, when you remember Mark Vivian Foy uh, yes. years ago, 2003, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes. So, they, they, they actually, uh, I think, they were looking around, seeing what's happening, and all that. nobody know, knew what to do. So, many minutes were lost. And then the player was actually moved, you know. Uh, to you know, uh, from from the field, and then mm. so there's so many minutes lost, and so he didn't survive. Okay, mm. I think mm. I think the the rate of survival is only about ten percent. You know, in these instances, if you, oh. you wow. yeah, uh, it's been mentioned before. But the most important thing is now, the thing that 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 we need to learn from from what happened to Christian Eriksen. I'm a I'm a Spurs fan, by the way. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah, I, I, I truly held uh, Christian Eriksen as, as, as a great player for so many years. Um, and uh, I was sad to see him leave. But at that point, I think he has run his course for, for his Spurs. But the thing about this is that um, they, they, they reacted very quickly. All right? Mm -hmm. Firstly, uh, there was a player himself who was there within seconds of what, uh, when this happened. The player was there. I think it was... Uh, Simon Kier, right? Yes. Uh, team yeah. captain. Captain? Yep. Yes. Yeah, captain. Uh, team captain. So make sure that the uh, you know Christian was in uh, in the right position uh, so that uh, his tongue doesn't fall back, right? Yeah. Right position. And then I think I think he commenced uh, CPR as well uh, while the uh, the medical staff were rushing onto the field, to that side of the field. And I think uh, when when this happens, I think the, the FIFA protocol. Uh, has, has started from the time I mean, it was developed after the Mark Vivian Fowey incident. Uh, the protocol is if, if somebody falls uh, without collision, all right? Mm. So you must, the index of suspicion for cardiovascular incident or, 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 uh, or problem uh, that uh, authorizes uh, the medical personnel to rush onto the field regardless of what the referee says. Okay. Mm. Okay, um, and uh, and all this happened after only the Mark Vivian four incident, yeah. Yeah, because because mm. everybody looking at the referee, yeah. everybody looking around to see, mm. and then you want to transport the player out of vision, out of sight into the into the stadium and all that. That yeah. you're wasting time. 
So what happened was they had to go right there and do it then and there. All right. Yep. Now the thing, of course, uh, the all the uh, spectators at the stadium will be witnessing this. The family were there, you know, the wife and the parents were there as well. I read the reports, but uh, this all very distressing, and it was very courageous of uh, of the, the players to form a ring uh, to obscure, uh, you know, uh, any yeah. any sight of of the player. So this is really truly remarkable. Some of them were watching uh, what was proceeding at at the, at the site. Uh, others were turning their backs because it was too distressing for them to, to continue to witness. But mm-hmm. they still they stood together. I think I think this is the best vision of of a of a team together uh, uh, and signifying team spirit I've ever seen. Yeah. In my life. You know, this is the best example. And 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 truly, when you see uh, players like that and representing a nation, you know that the nation is, is itself is well sorted out because its citizens. Uh, we'll do the right thing, the right way at the right time. Okay, so this is it is something that we need to realize as a nation when we when we develop things for ourselves and 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 uh, you know uh, to increase our levels of excellence within sport. Now, coming back to to the situation, uh, I think the the, the biggest uh, factor uh, the the I think the referee himself I think uh, recognized the situation very well, so um, he would not have have stood in the way. Uh, he would have been totally cognizant of, of the requirements of the protocol and uh, everybody rushed that. So the institution of, of the, uh, the first aid, you know, the first response was very timely. It was, it was uh, I think, probably within, within a minute, a few minutes, not more than a minute or two, and everybody you know, responded quickly. So I think that probably uh, saved his life. Uh, all this collective urgency, sense of urgency and knowing the right thing to do. You know, the incidence of all this is one in 50,000. It's not very common, you know, for, for things mm-hmm. to happen like this on the field. One in 50,000. So we can be forgiven if we say that somebody doesn't know what to do. But yet, you are not preparing for that one in 50,000, yeah. yeah. right? Uh, as much as uh, recognizing this as, as a mere statistic. Because that one in 50,000 could well be your your friend, your relative, mm-hmm. you know, even yourself. So the most important thing is for us to recognize that we're always preparing for that one in 50,000. We're not preparing for the 50,000. So the most important thing is for us to always be prepared. So that's why uh, medical teams, uh, including ISM, uh, we, we have to have everybody um, accredited uh, with CPR, right? So the, the, the accreditation is for two years and you have to renew every two years, right? So in, in ISM and I think in, in many other places, of course, hospitals, they have to do this. It's basic life support, BLS. And there's another one, advanced life support, ELS. Uh, I did uh, NCC uh, uh, as a medical officer uh, after I left uh, GHKL in 1989. I was in Kwantan Hospital for a year. So I was an anesthetist. So that was... You know, it was it was uh, important for me to know how to do CPR right, as an anesthetist. So I, um, I I fully recognize this need for for all medical staff uh, to be fully prepared. That is medical staff. We understand that it's part and parcel of our job. But the most impressive thing, you know, I'm most impressed with the fact that the players themselves know how to do this. Yes, the CPR. Yeah. Yes, and and it's something that we need to to, to emulate. Uh, to model ourselves uh, after, because because I think I think um, uh, if if you teach players how to perform CPR uh, on adults on uh, on adolescents uh, or, or teenagers and also on children on babies, I think uh, there will come a time you know and God forbid if it happens to members of your own family you know at your house, yeah, uh, sometimes it can happen and it's most useful for citizens in our country uh, to, be, to be taught how to do proper CPR. Most of the time, people know the steps, all right? But the technique with which they do it um, and, uh, and the, the rate of, of, of chest compression and all that uh, is sometimes not, not, not proper. So it's something that you need to get right. And once you get right, you need to, to practice. Um, in, in the medical domain, we have uh, mannequins that we can uh, access, uh, we can practice on, okay? Mm-hmm. And, uh, and uh, you have to keep up the skills, you know? So it's something that you prepare for. 
even if it will never happen, you have to prepare for it. Mm. Because, and, yeah. because sometimes it might well happen when you least expect it, you know. Yeah, okay. yeah, and, and and doctor, you know, uh, for for our listeners out there, perhaps you can explain to us what's the difference between a cardiac arrest and a heart attack. <laughs> you know, the heart attack that you get, mm. you know, um, somebody who's been smoking too much, you know, is mm. obese, doesn't exercise, you know, if, um, and has a lot of stress in his life and work. Yeah, suddenly you have that that so called heart attack. That heart, heart attack is called myocardial infarction. Okay. Mm-hmm. Myocardial infarction is when um, the uh, coronary arteries, right? Coronary arteries are blocked uh, by accumulation of, of all that cholesterol and uh, and platelet aggregation over many years and all that. And suddenly, uh, the heart dies because the, the coronary arteries that supply the heart muscle mm-hmm. is 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 uh, uh, you know there, there are several arteries there. If they are blocked. Um, then, then the the heart will die. So that is myocardial infarction. That's a heart attack. Okay. okay. And in this case, for cardiac arrest, what what actually uh-huh. happened to the heart? Yeah. Cardiac arrest has hmm. so many has so many uh, causes. You know. Okay. So it is it is important for us. Uh, after we've already talked about the importance of the first response, um, the basic life support and all that, yeah. uh, and to to respond as quickly as possible uh, without delay. Uh, without undue delay anyway. So we, we have to recognize that uh, a lot of these people are healthy, you know. Yeah. They're, they're, they're typically healthy people. Let me give you an example. They're of sportsmen. Like, How healthy is they? How healthy can they get? Uh, that's the thing. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, I mean, at the end of the day, we expect them not to, to be having any problems with their heart. Yes? Yeah. Okay? Mm-hmm. But yeah, you, you will understand that a lot of athletes carry enlarged Hearts with thickened uh, heart muscle, you know, uh, and this is is because of a response to to prolonged long term uh, high intensity training. So the, the heart muscles become become thickened, uh, undergoes hypertrophy. All right, this hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy uh, cardiomyopathy is is meaning is something a uh, problem with the heart muscle. Yes, mm-hmm. so this is what happened to Mark Vivian for you because because uh, they, they they look at that. They did the uh, the autopsy and all that, so it was determined that he he passed away due to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hypertrophic meaning that it is overgrown. Okay, trophic means grow, hyper means too much. So an extra growth of the muscle. The problem with 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 thickened heart muscle of the ventricles and so the auricles is actually uh, it will it will interfere in the in the con- the electrical conduction. Okay, that keeps the the heart pumping. Pumping. Mm. Yes. You see, the, the problem with, with all of this is that there comes a time when the heart undergoes tachycardia. Tachycardia means an increased uh, heart rate. Yes? Mm-hmm. Um, that is why when we exercise, uh, we need to monitor our heart rate. It is very, very important for us to monitor the heart rate. Why? Because, number one, because uh, we have to get into the training zone. If we don't... Um, uh, challenge our 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 system uh, in such a way that we achieve seventy percent, about seventy percent of our maximum heart rate. Then, then you know, you basically you're not going to achieve much in terms of of the benefits of exercise. But at the same time, you wouldn't want to go beyond hundred percent of maximum heart rate for too too long a time, because what can happen is that you can become tachycardic. You can go like a runaway train going downhill. Okay. Like a boulder rolling downhill, and then the, it's difficult for you to to stop it. To 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 even when you you stop the exercise and you rest, it is still rolling around, uh, rolling down that that uh, that slope, uh, gaining speed faster and faster. The problem with tachycardia when it becomes uh, very very fast like that is 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 it becomes uh, uh, asynchronous. That means uh, you see the the the, the heart. And there are four uh, chambers there, and they're all um, pumping and uh, relaxing, pumping in synchronous fashion. Okay, mm-hmm. there's a certain rhythm to it. Uh, but when when the heart uh, is beating faster, you, the the heart loses that synchronicity, you know. So it is pumping uh, willy nilly, and before long, when it gets to a point where it becomes 200 beats per minute and above. What happens is that it is just quivering, you know, you know, like a, a fasciculation. 
like quivering if you if you mm-hmm. I, there's no video here, so I, I can't show mm-hmm. but, yeah. but the thing is it's just quivering it is just shaking without actually pumping all right mm-hmm. so the, the heart rate is increased but it's just quivering it was just shaking and and uh, and all that but not no blood is pumped okay so uh, what happens is that the blood is not reaching uh, other parts of the body and more critically it is not reaching the brain all right mm. so what happens is that uh, as in uh, the case that we saw with uh, Christian Eriksen yeah he must have felt like he did at that point whatever the cause of the cardiac arrest may have been um this is something that that happens uh then what happens is that he just feels like he didn't he will fall right he will fall mm. right there are instances uh which are actually not all as common when it is, doesn't even quiver all right there's a total loss of electrical conduction in the heart okay that we that one is called asystole asystole means there's no conduction electrical conduction it just basically stops and uh and it doesn't function at all then then basically uh you know a person undergoing that is is basically dead and no amount of defibrillation will, will help whereas in in this this situation where you have this cardiac arrest where the heart is not pumping it's just quivering that is why you use the uh, you know the defibrillator the one that they had was a portable one that they were able to bring on the field and then of course uh, when the paramedics came in with the uh, with the evacuation equipment and all that so they he was put on on the basic life support oxygen so on and so forth uh, there was also a uh, uh, defibrillator uh, and a heart monitor together it, it is all in one situation but that defibrillator is the other factor the uh, if if you deploy the defibrillator early enough uh, you're able to to shock the heart out of that uh, runaway train uh, you know uh, tachycardic uh, uh, weight uh, that 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 is killing the the player and it will store the heartbeat back to normal all right so this is something that is key the the first response responder action the cpr um the on site uh, institution of 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 uh, you know emergency treatment and the defibrillator was deployed as early as possible all right they recognized the situation and it was really really excellent of them to be able to do that another interesting thing is whenever i think i've, I've i think few time i've seen player fall especially during the corner kick or uh-huh. and then they fall and suddenly you know all these players when there, there's no movement suddenly all these players come and surround them and then they have to prevent uh, the what they rush to prevent him from swallowing his own tongue uh-huh. why why yeah. why is it happening basically is is uh, we wanted to know this but then we see many times so what what is it got to do whenever they fall they swallow the tongue is it a common thing or is it happen yeah. like a reflection a reflex it's not actually swallowing your tongue because it's, it's actually physically impossible to swallow your own tongue you know basically <laughs> but, that's correct this is just is just an uh, an expression because uh, what happens is that when you actually when your when your neck is flexed actually not because you've extended when your neck is flexed what the cap the back of the tongue can fall back can fall back right uh mm-hmm. and 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 obstruct your your airways you know obstruct your trachea or the airways the breathing airway all right mm-hmm. so this is the the danger because the tongue will fall, fall back and 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 obstruct the uh, the airway and Uh, nothing is 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 coming in in terms of of the air that that you know that that should be coming in to provide the oxygen uh to continue and to survive so the first thing that you need to do uh, your abc is know that of course you have to put the patient in the position now the easiest thing to do to prevent this uh this tongue from falling back and to and you know obstructing the trachea is uh, for for the for the the chin to be you know pulled up and extending the thing uh gently all right why gently is because sometimes there might be an associated uh fracture of 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 the uh of the uh, cervical vertebra in the neck all right so you shouldn't use, use it for you just gently push it up to make sure that then the airway is clear because the, then the tongue will will fall back into its original safe position and uh and sometimes to make sure that uh, sometimes people also vomit all right and this this vomitus might uh, come up from from the esophagus oh. 
yeah, come up from the stomach through the esophagus, and then it might enter the trachea. And because it is acidic, okay, it will then cause a problem by scorching uh, the airways, you know, right? Because it's acidic, stomach acid, you know. Uh, so you can scorch the, the and cause uh, inflammation and swelling. And there was a certain syndrome that we should always, uh, when, when I was working as an anesthetist one year, we were always afraid uh, to get uh, to do uh, cesarean sections. Why? Because um, most of the mothers who come in on an emergency basis and needing a cesarean section, um, you know, to, to deliver their babies, they're not well prepared, they're not fasted, and sometimes their stomach is full. So we really have to look out for this and make sure that, uh, that they don't, uh, you know, they don't swallow their own vomitus uh, that comes up and then it goes into your, your, your trachea or your, or your airway that will then cause problems and cause pneumonia later on and you may die from it. It's called Mendelssohn syndrome. So I remember that as in my training. But the, this is something that has to be recognized. So uh, one thing is to, to, to extend, uh, you know, uh, push the chin up to extend uh, gently. But also you can put the, the, the athlete on the side. But this will be difficult if you need to do CPR. Okay? So uh, sometimes uh, when, when the, uh, the first responders come in, they all have the equipment uh, with the, uh, you know, with the, um, uh, you know, to, there's a certain implement that you can put into, into the mouth uh, to make sure that you, you hold the tongue in place and out of the way, not to obstruct the, the airway any, uh, in, in any way. Uh, so that is when it's most important. But when you're alone and all that, you must really uh, just do the simple thing. You just, to just push the chin up uh, gently to, to, to make sure that the tongue goes out of the way and doesn't occlude or obstruct the, the airway. So that, that is the reason why. Yeah. So I, I think uh, because the ABCs, airway, breathing, and then uh, of course the, the heart, uh, uh, circulation, uh, those are the, the important things to, to remember. Uh, a, B, C, airway, breathing. You must make sure that the, the, the athlete or the player is breathing. Okay, You must look for chest movement and all that. And then, of course, with circulation, you must look for the pulse to make sure that the, uh, the heart is pumping. Usually, uh, you, you, put, you, you, you look for the, the, the pulse on the carotid at the side of the neck. All right? on, on, on only one side, not on both sides. If you press both sides of the carotid, the, you know, any, even a guy can, even a healthy guy can pass out because what you'll be doing is you'll be occluding uh, blood supply to the brain. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so there you go. Uh, so, 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 so there yeah. are some tips there, some, some very important tips. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. That's why never let anybody put his hand on your neck, you know. Never. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. Hmm. Uh, never, because, because it, can, it can kill you. So that's, that's the most important thing to realize. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many things that can go wrong when somebody puts his hand on somebody's neck. Yeah. So when somebody does that, you really have to get the fellow off. Mm -hmm. So the most, even it happens in football matches, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah. They, I mean, they, and, and, and we are pretty sure they're not checking. They are not checking each other's pulse. At, pulse at <laughs> no, 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 no. No pulse. Or they're checking to see whether the tongue is still there or not. No. <laughs> yes, yes. But, but uh, another thing, I, I mean, uh, doctor, um, what do yes, you was. think that the football authority or any, or any sports association, I mean, they need to do in order to make sure that, you know, they are well prepared to handle this kind of situation in the future? Now that we know yeah. that with this Ericsson incident, you know, it's really sparked yeah. a lot of debate, a lot of conversation about it. What would be the yeah. next best thing moving forward? I think, I think uh, you know, you know the saying, um, you either win, okay, or you learn, yes. Um, if you, if you, even if you lose, but you learn, you still win eventually. So I think, I think it's, it's a great learning thing uh, for everyone. You can always learn anything because even for this given situation, there's so many, um, you know, variations of the same situation that can happen anytime. You should be prepared uh, to deal with anything. So the authorities, uh, the, uh, FIFA and all the national FAs, football associations, I think they have made all the right uh, des uh, policy decisions. Uh, I, I'm, I'm familiar with uh, the previous medical director of FIFA. Uh, and, um, and, and we, we, we mentioned, uh, we, we met once at a, at a football conference, sports injury conference, and we were talking about this thing. 
Uh, and at the time, I, the, the, the biting impression that I had is that these people are all well sorted out. You know, they're very professional. Uh, they're, all, they're all very, uh, they're all experts at what they do uh, and professional with how they do it. And uh, always uh, with the health and safety of the player uh, uppermost, you know. The health and safety of the player is always of paramount importance. Other, all other considerations will always pale in comparison. It is practically nothing when you compare to the loss of a life, especially when it happens on a field. Yes, so it is. It is something that will that will be uh, that will be disastrous for for uh, for the uh, future conduct of, of any sport if the policy makers and the and the you know people who govern the sport are not taking the right policy decisions to ensure that uh, the health and safety of, of the players under their, their charge, under their care, is always held uh, to be of something of paramount importance. So I think, I think uh, the associations are all fine. He says that when it comes to the national associations, um, the, how it cascades down to the state FAs, to uh, the district FAs and all that, it is something which is actually a bigger challenge, all right? Because to be honest with you, this is not something which is esoteric. This is not something special that only like VAR, like uh, with video assisted referee, yeah, right? Where only when you have the you, you play the top games, then you have VAR and all that, you know. Um, this is basic life support, you know, basic and, and survival. It apply, and it applies for everyone who involved in sports. Everybody. Yes. Applies for everybody. So even if, or I would say, if it is school sports, I think it's mandatory for the teachers and coaches at school sports to be able to do, uh, to perform proper CPR and to be polishing up and, and practicing this uh, regularly, keeping up with all their accreditative, uh, uh, you know, uh, situations. Um, and, and furthermore, working with children. You will be very disastrous. It's one thing for a 29 or 30-year-old guy playing professional football, you know, risking his life and all that uh, to be undergoing this. But can you imagine the loss of a life of a seven or eight-year-old kid playing, uh, you know, sports at school? Mm. It, it, yeah. Unimaginable, I mean, you know? It's a very good point you brought up about schools. Even it, this has to go down all the way to the school system as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. So I think, I think the role of FEM at this moment so of course they, they I think they have already done this uh, for many years now because because they are national associations they have to follow FIFA's uh, you know mandates uh, fastidiously. There's no escaping from that. They will always uh, you know look at how how the national associations are complying, um, uh, just like uh, anti doping and all that, uh, injury management, of course the health and safety uh, regulations and protocols that they have instituted. But when it cascades down to state and district and schools, this is something that uh, I think uh, the national associations should, should play a bigger role in ensuring that uh, uh, not only in terms of just serving the affiliates that 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 uh, that vote them in. You know what I'm saying, right? Sometimes people do things for the sake of uh, you know um, you know uh, Ambil Hati affiliates and all that. But the thing is, they are not governing the affiliates, they're governing the sport, right? So they have an obligation to make sure that the sport is always at the top. Uh, and all the, the top priorities in terms of the governance of the game, the conduct of the game, rules, regulations, and all the protocols for health and safety are all there and complied with, um, uh, you know, uh, in the strictest sense of the word, yes? So I feel that uh, that this is the next challenge. To do this, it is not just enough to have courses and seminars and workshops and all that. There ought to be a monitoring mechanism. Because at the end of the day, there's no point in, in just starting something, like, like having a car. You buy a car and then you never service the car. Yeah, You never uh, you know, uh, top up the, the, the radiator fluid. Uh, check the battery fluid, so on and so forth. So you never service the thing and the car will fail one day just when you need it to go. And sometimes it can even be disastrous if you meet an accident in the middle of the road because you have not maintained the car properly. So in, in the same sense of the word, it is, it is important for us to, to establish something, to practice it, uh, practice all the, uh, all the right protocols and principles and then to monitor not only the conduct of the, of the, of the right uh, protocols, 
but the quality of, of, of uh, the performance of these protocols as well, yeah, at all levels. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. Yeah, okay. And, uh, and doctor, you know, uh, let's talk about some injuries now. You know, there are lots of players with lots of potential out there, you know, people like Michael Owen, uh, Ronaldo, uh-huh. and of course, you know, Marco Van Basten for as well, you know, that, uh, you know, his career was basically cut short by uh, injuries that uh, was basically irreversible. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there really like uh, no modern medicine or anything that cannot be done to actually have a solution to this kind of cases? I mean, I, maybe back then, but what do you think nowadays? I, I mean, just just to <laughs> just to top up with uh, Elwin's question, doctor. I mean, uh, yeah. I mean, I, I we we understand that wear and tear is is part of the nature of 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 athletes as they progress in their career with the trainings, the intensity, the performance, and all that. But yeah. Is there any such way that you know it can be lessened burden on the athletes? In I mean, I, I'm not too sure. Maybe these days, perhaps with the modern med- med- medication, things have improved yeah. vastly compared to when Marco and Bast- Baston days, where he had to cut short his career at a very young age. Yeah. 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 I mean, maybe you can shed some light on this. That's a shame, eh? isn't it? You know, there, there, there's so many types of injury, of course. You, you know this. Um, mm-hmm. yeah. when, when it happens in, in, uh, in a football match, yes? Uh, you understand because, because it's an occupational risk. Yes? It's an occupational hazard to get injured uh, mm-hmm. during yes. the course of, of the game. But you know, there's another injury that to me is more of a sin. Uh, you know, injuries that can, can, can easily be, well, um, of course, with, with the grace of the Almighty all the time, that can mm-hmm. be avoided. Mm-hmm. You know, that can be avoided to make sure that it doesn't happen. Which is actually getting getting injured while training, you know, mm, okay. uh, not so much playing, uh, you know, when you play uh, when you have drills and all that. No, mm. it is in the gym when you overload uh, a, a player or an athlete beyond uh, the physical limits. So what I'm saying is that sometimes you may exert too much uh, load over too short a period of time. And the athlete is unable to recover uh, from uh, from the, the overload. This will result in what we call a repetitive overload injury. All right, the the thing that results in in chronic inflammation, um, you know, like Achilles uh, tendinitis, yes, uh, all these tendinopathies or inflammations, and of course, after a while, it is not just inflammation. There's also a degenerative element to it. So what you have is a tendinosis. That means inflammation plus degeneration, which of course will interfere in the continued uh, um, optimal function of, 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 of the muscle or the tendon or the ligament. So these things happen over time. And sometimes uh, you don't notice it until you, it gets uh, to be too much and suddenly you have uh, swelling, limitation of movement, uh, that that uh, then uh, you know um, spurs you to get the proper medical attention and um, and and proper diagnosis. So this is this is the thing that that sometimes is not only a primary concern um, when athletes are, are training up, developing their strength, uh, power, endurance, uh, so on and so forth, but also um, can be secondary to the initial uh, uh, injury they, they get on the field. Sometimes, um, let's say, for example, we, we, we talk about somebody with the anterior cruciate ligament injury. Yes? You know about the ACL? ACL. Yes. Yeah, yes. Uh, ACL, yeah very famous. In fact, uh, <laughs> uh, there's so many people walking around, um, you know, uh, after surgery for the ACL. So, uh, the quality of the surgery, last time they used to do open uh, surgery, so you can see a real track scar over the, the front of the knee, really ugly. And that one really results in so much uh, fibrosis underneath that, uh, that the, the, the proper uh, full range of movement of, of, of the joint or the knee where the, uh, if, uh, is, is, is no longer normal and uh, the, the proper function is, is not attainable anymore. So that's why people used to, uh, to uh, you know, retire so early uh, during those days. Now, the, the techniques... Um, they don't have to open up the knee like that. 
they do what we call through a foscopy, the so-called, you know, uh, commonly known as a keyhole surgery, where they just poke two holes within you, uh, in, inside the knee. They're able to poke, uh, you know, uh, for, for the uh, drainage of, 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 uh, of the uh, procedure and also a scope there you have also uh, implements to snip off uh, bits and pieces of the torn cartilage, you know, and of course to make all the necessary repairs uh, to insert a replacement for a totally torn anterior cruciate ligament or ACL. Uh, they used to take uh, the middle portion of the infrapatella tendon, you know, the, below your kneecap, you have that, that tendon. It's actually a ligament, but they call, they call it tendon. So they take uh, the one third of that and use that as a replacement. But nowadays, uh, it's, it's no longer in favor because it uh, results in uh, difficulty or, or, or further inflammation problems uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the patellar movement. So they're taking a part of the bicep femur, you know, the hamstring tendon at the back, the back of the, the knee, right? So there's a tendon uh, on the outside of the back of the knee. That's called the bicep femoris tendon. So they, they are taking uh, a piece of that uh, to insert, uh, uh, to replace uh, the, um, you know, at the location of the anterior cruciate ligament so that the knee may then uh, recover and be as, as optimal as possible in terms of its function. So the ACL, that is just a surgery, you know. Um, most of the time, um, surgery is only 50% of, of, the, of the story. If you think that the surgery will solve everything, I think we will be sadly mistaken. Uh, the most important thing to realize the surgery is only half the story. The other half is the rehabilitation. All right? So for typical ACL reconstruction, everybody will ask, you know, sometimes you cannot say that ACL will recover in six months, in eight months, you know, you apply for every different case. Every person who tears any part of the, of, of the body, any injury, you cannot, you cannot uh, put a timetable to it. You, you just have to treat uh, every uh, athlete who is injured on its own merits, you know, they have their own particular wants. Uh, I mean, uh, requirements and needs. Everybody is different, so we, we really have to be careful. Sometimes I I I I'm really really worried about uh, approaches in treatment and rehabilitation when people just blindly follow protocols without um, looking at the response of the athlete. You know, if you say, "Oh, I follow the protocols," one, two, three, four, five, you just have to apply every part of the uh, the process. And look at the at the response. You know, yeah. is is the response good? Is it uh, responding well, or is it causing more pain, more swelling? You know, then you have to pull back on the on the intensity of the of the of the process, whether it is an exercise or a stretch or whatever. So it is very important for you to titrate. Titrate meaning you you put the load, you you put something into something by looking at how. Uh, the patient responded to the previous load, you see? So you titrate. That means you measure You measure according to the previous reaction. You cannot just institute something according to some formula, some cookbook recipe that you, you, you've uh, read online or in a book or whatever because the, 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 the athlete or the player is a living, breathing uh, being, you know, and they will always respond differently from one person to the next. Mm -hmm. So I think the, the important thing uh, is not only rehabilitation, but a properly titrated, planned, and executed uh, program of rehabilitation suited to that particular individual. So when you have the, uh, you know, the surgeon has done his work, uh, there's so many surgeons who can do a proper job, but most of the failure where it results in not only a prolonged uh, period of recovery, but even in, in failure to relaunch, a failure to recover and, and return to play uh, is sometimes caused by inadequate um, rehabilitation or sometimes um, even with our best intentions, our best execution, uh, the, 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 the player will then, even when they return to play, um, uh, they're, 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 the problem is uh, the, the transition between the rehabilitation and, and the conditioning is another challenge. Okay, so now we're talking about um, uh, we've talked about the surgery and we talked about rehabilitation. But before there's return to play, there's something else. You see, the physiotherapist will work on you in terms of your post-operative uh, rehabilitation. But one thing that you have to realize is that uh, the, 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 the player can be discharged uh, medically 
Uh, there's no more pain, no more swelling. There's full uh, range of movement and all that. So clinically, that's fine. But in terms of sports performance, the the the, the, the player is nowhere near uh, the levels that uh, that he or she should be should be getting back to. So I think I think uh, the the role of of the conditioning expert in in merging uh, that transition that in, in managing that uh, that transition well between the physiotherapist and the conditioning expert is when you develop uh, something uh, after the clinical recovery, you develop uh, the program in order for them to recover the physical uh, conditioning and, and, and fitness parameters that they were at before the injury. There has been uh, in the past, uh, you know, some instances where actually players are even better after they have recovered from surgery. Uh, this is something that is recognized uh, especially in players who were not at peak form or optimal form before uh, they, they, uh, they, they went for, for surgery. So this one is where we call supranormal attainment. That means above uh, the, norm, the previous normal. But actually, there was, there's so much room for improvement for that particular uh, player that sometimes uh, by addressing all the previous weaknesses that can lead to the, the, the injury in the first place. Because when you want to prevent injury, uh, all this conditioning work has two functions. The first function is to, to of course, to enhance uh, the performance. But the second function, which is not fully realized, is that all this conditioning work, strengthening, you know, um, stretching, uh, reaction time, so on and so forth, is to avoid, to prevent injuries. So that's why the conditioning program in the gymnasiums, all that strength work, all that uh, speed, power, endurance uh, that is being done in the gym and, of course, on the field as well with the, all the functional uh, exercises are all there to improve your, your, your you know, execution of your performance but also to prevent injuries. You'll be in a much better, much better platform uh, and, 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 uh, than if you uh, don't take it seriously and you take it too lightly or uh, sometimes when you have an injury, you do not report so that the, the medical uh, team uh, will be able to pay proper attention to it and have a look at it. Okay. okay. So, sorry for the long-winded <laughs> explanation. But no, no, uh, no. there you go. No, no. So, yeah. we, 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 it's something that we want to learn more about when it comes to uh, athletes and sports or footballers, injuries and all that. Trying to understand yeah. the, how, how challenging is the recovery process. And as you clearly mentioned, that sometimes, uh, I think in, in one prime example I would give is Ruth Van Nistelrooy. Because after his uh -huh. injury, he came to Man United. He became a much, even a better player than he was before <laughs> the injury. So, yeah, I mean, well, it's, it's, it's a good point. It's a good point that you shared with us. Okay. Yeah. All right. Anyway, Elwin and Bala, any, any last <laughs> questions from you guys? Uh, just, uh, just, doctor, I, uh, I have one regarding, because you're talking about physical health and all that, right? Okay, let's, let's go back to that Christian Erickson situation again, and let's look at mental health, okay? Do you think, do you think it's actually right for UEFA to put the decision on the players to ask them whether, you know, shall we continue to play that game? You know, do you guys want to continue to play that game after what they just witnessed? Or this should be this should be a decision by the authority, like saying, okay, let's forget about it, let's let them rest, and let's continue the next day. Because the players could be, we don't know what they're going through. They could be under some pressure. They may have answered out of duress, you know. So, so we don't know. But, but what do you think, doctor? This, this the mental health in this situation. I think yeah. I think yeah. it's, it's not a level playing field situation, you know. Mm. Yeah, mm. The, 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 you can you can look at the time when when uh, Christian Eriksen was was being given treatment mm. on the field. How distressed they were, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, you just put yourself in their situation. Would you want to play? No, right? and, and, so I think and, I think I think yeah. many of these these so-called football authorities have lost touch with what's happening on the ground. Uh, you know, uh, with, with what's best for players. Uh, look, in all fairness. How can you expect something like that? Because it affects everybody. This is a team. This is not an individual sport, you yeah, know. Yeah, and, exactly. and, and, and even more so when you consider that uh, Ericsson uh, is, is a very important player, you know. Uh, and even if he's not an important player in, in terms of, of his contribution, his role in the, in, in, the, in the team and so on and so forth, the whole team is now upset. 
they're not in a situation where they can concentrate on, on uh, the execution of the task. Mm -hmm. And to find out later on that they were practically strong-armed into going back onto the field, I, I, I really feel that there is something wrong here. And I think this situation must be reviewed uh, and scrutinized properly uh, in the next uh, forum where you know these decision makers will gather and then and, and, and review uh, you know incidences like this and make sure that they come up with improved uh, you know uh, consideration uh, and and don't worry about about scheduling you know uh, postponing matches and all that come on. Uh, I mean, if mental you, health you, is yes equally yeah. important as physical health. Yeah, and, and I tell you because because some of them sometimes we assume oh they are athletes they're strong minded they should mm. be able to survive this, but you know all it takes is just one mind that is scarred by this, right? It stays with you for for whole life, and suddenly yeah. you 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 don't get the life the quality of life that you deserve if it, if this had been properly handled otherwise, okay. Mm -hmm. So I think on the whole, I, I'm totally in disagreement with the way it was decided. Mm. I think they have done well to suspend the match. And, uh, and uh, the, the rules, of course, dictate that if you suspend and it doesn't go on, then you forfeit the match and you, in, you know, 3-0. Uh, I think if I were the, um, uh, the uh, you know, uh, in the management of the team, all right? At least on the other side of the coin, we have mm. to recognize that as well. Because the rules are there, right? Mm -hmm. You forfeit the match, you lose 3 0, correct? Okay. Yes. Yes. Then I would say, for the sake of my players and their mental health, we cannot continue. You know, let it be so. Because we cannot continue to play in this sort of environment and it is not fair. At least that will force the whole thing into, into everybody will look up and say, people are willing to sacrifice, you know, uh, points uh, in order to do the right thing. Not only by the players, but by the team. And by the future of the team as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Totally, totally agree. Totally agree. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So it's totally not done, lah. <laughs> ah, yeah, really, la. You know, I, I, to be honest with you, when I first heard this uh, about this, I had expected the match to be abandoned. You know, <laughs> a lot of us actually. Of us, <laughs> suddenly, of us. suddenly after one hour, we saw these guys coming out again. <laughs> it's like what? Yeah. No, I, I went. I actually went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I went to sleep. I woke up in the morning. Hey. These bozos played. I say, man, you know, <laughs> why did they play? And then but, I read that they were basically strong army to play, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so man, I mean, but then UEFA came out and said it was the players' decisions and all this, you know, they, they kind of put it back on the players. But I, to me, I personally don't think you should oh. put this decision on the players, you see. They, they, no, you don't know what, yeah. they are under duress. Yeah. What sort of quality of decision making are they supposed yes, to have? Exactly, exactly. Yes. Isn't true, it? True. Ah, yes. So it was really uncouth of them. To say that it's up to the players when actually uh, you have this 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 sword hanging over their heads, yeah, right. And suddenly they, you know, in that in that muddled, uh, disturbed uh, state of mind, suddenly they say, okay, we just go. Sometimes it is whatever it was, it was an emotional decision, yeah, right. It yeah, was an emotional. Yeah. If they they felt that uh, we have to honor, you know, mm. our players and carry on regardless and all that. So it's brave, yes, it's brave. But, uh, but sometimes you, you really have to look at this. Look, at the end of the day, I will always commend the team whatever they desire. But the most important thing is sometimes when you are governing the sport, all right? Uh, and uh, because you have match, you have the referee, the match referee, and other officials who, who, uh, you know, who actually take charge of the match, or the conduct of the match, they have to huddle together, you know, and, and make a collective uh, or joint decision together with the, uh, the team management. And then do it uh, in the best, uh, um, you know, the best um, uh, in the best interest of, of all the players. Because sometimes we think it's the Denmark players. Uh, we, we shouldn't think that the Finland players are not will not be affected as well. Yeah, yeah. Yes, exactly. Sometimes the teammates they know each other, hmm. um, you know, and some of them have, have played uh, in the same team hmm. uh, before, so on and so forth. And they are fellow professionals. I'm sure they are affected as well. Indeed, so what indeed. sort of spectacle are we expecting after such an incident of all? Yeah, and, and you could clearly see the player the, they were not focused. The, the Danish team, you know, they were not focused. The the way the, yeah. the goal, Finland scored the goal as well. Their minds yeah. were just not not in the game. Yeah. 
I understand. I understand. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it's is is uh, most understandable and forgivable. Yeah. But I, yeah. I think it's an instance where they have to really study uh, what happened, and then they have to come up and see whether they can refine the policies in the further yeah. to make sure exactly. uh, the best interests of the players are always uh, upheld and and uh, and protected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sure. Okay, Bala. Any last questions from yourself? Well. Uh... Before before I ask my last question, I would like to say that thank you for Doctor who are attending to our show. And then uh, just just because we all are bound to nature and uh, and, and we do have our weaknesses. And yeah. by we we as time passes, you know, we get older and as I try to think. So so as athlete or even as uh, normal people, we, we we cannot predict death or even this kind of incident happening. So do you think modern or perhaps any technological activity could happen in the future? By at least it could predict something happened. But we have a success story as well, uh, something like Kanu, whereby he had a heart problem and he became a player, but a good player in Arsenal. Uh, <laughs> so there is a number yeah. of success story as well. But uh, is it getting smaller, or maybe in the future they could able to perhaps before a game start, they check on the heart heartbeat and they able to detect okay, this guy cannot play. Yeah. Is that, well, is that, uh, there, is, there is one more story I have to relate to you. Okay. From my archives over 30 years, <laughs> oh, okay. um, you, you can you can you can call it a, a bit of a success story. Success in the sense that we avoided a disaster ourselves within even in the nation circles. Okay, um, this was uh, about uh, an athlete, um, uh, a walker. All right, um, about to to uh, you know uh, schedule to compete at the Sea Games. Hmm. So. What happened is that um, um, there is a, uh, a requirement for athletes to be given a full medical checkup, all right, um, before they start training, before they start competing in earnest uh, over the course of the year. And of course, uh, we can of course revisit and uh, re-examine the, the, the player or the athlete from time to time at regular intervals. Uh, especially if there are any, any complaints or any problems uh, with their health. Now, there was one instance when uh, this, this particular athlete, I was actually doing the examination myself, okay? I'm, I'm not a cardiologist, uh, so I'm not uh, so expert in terms of reading the ECG. But this ECG literally jumped at me, uh, and I looked at it, there's something wrong here, you know? Because, because it was an irregular um, beat, you know? And, and uh, uh, my sense at the time is that if this is not normal, then it should be investigated. So I, uh, I referred this to IJN at the time. Uh, and uh, I had uh, uh, colleagues uh, from, from UKM and when I was studying, it was still there and all that. So we managed to look at this. So what happened is that sometimes you, you think an endurance athlete who, who walks 20 kilometers, all right, um, should be fit. Okay, and, and not have any, any heart problems. But sometimes in the course of working so hard, what has happened is that for this particular athlete, um, sorry, it was a female athlete, so it was 10 kilometers, not 20. So what happened is that um, the, um, the, she had acquired what we call an accessory node. The sinus uh, atrial node, uh, is something that uh, that is the the precursor for the heartbeat, okay? For the conduction, electrical conduction, for the heart to beat to carry on uh, its function. What happens is that she had developed an accessory node. There was an additional node to uh, in addition to the normal one. How that happened? Whether it has always been there, and then suddenly it becomes uh, so prominent. So uh, we we do not know how it came about. Tapi, uh, she was a very well-trained athlete, you know, uh, truly up there in terms of, of the, uh, the, her training. Never had a problem before. But uh, I remember uh, months before that, uh, she had been down with, with dengue. She had a viral infection uh, months before that. Had recovered and all that. So that, that was a factor that, that uh, you know, we might have wanted to look at. Uh, but at, at that time, uh, what happened is that uh, the, uh, the, the cardiologist at the IGN uh, mentioned that uh, she had an, uh, an accessory node. What happens with an accessory node is that there might be a summation, you know, 
one one node is firing, the other node is firing, then you can summit, meaning it can it can combine and cause tachycardia. All right. When it causes tachycardia, what happens is that this whole train uh, hurtling down, uh, you know, the, the mountain, uh, you know, uh, happens again. Suddenly, the heart can go uh, tachycardic, uh, beat so fast, become suddenly uh, you will have cardiac arrest, just like uh, what uh, you know is known to happen in many cases of, of athletes uh, having trouble on the field of competition. So, so. The, fortunately, the, the treatment for, for that was relatively simple. What needed to be done was actually um, uh, just a clinic um, uh, appointment where that particular uh, accessory or extra node was deactivated by what they call a radio frequency ablation. Okay? Um, they use a radio frequency to knock out or to, to uh, deactivate that, that node so that only the primary node uh, will continue to function and that node will no longer be active. So that was what was done. Uh, so so that, that, that was something that we, we were most thankful uh, for, for, for one, to, 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 number one, to discover the thing in the first place and secondly, for the doctors in IGN to do, you know, to do well and uh, to uh, and uh, the, the athlete uh, herself continued to to uh, to compete many years after without any incident or any problems. So there you go. I think I think um, uh, the basic medical exam uh, at the beginning of the season for any football player is is a is a very important one. And I think with all the protocols that have been introduced in the recent past, do not only govern how uh, things are managed on the field. But also before uh, uh, you know players start training, and then subjecting themselves to high loads, uh, that will be uh, you know a big strain on, on their hearts. And I think uh, uh, a single examination is one thing, but uh, there must be a, uh, um, a sort of um, um, intermittent uh, examination or monitoring of of, of uh, the cardiological status of, of the players. At the same time, during any training session, nowadays you can see players wearing all these uh, straps across the chest. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, there's a there's a, yeah they, they, the 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 whole team is being monitored in terms of their heart rate. So there's a team um, uh, set uh, where where we can buy a set for for everyone in the team, and when they play, they, we can monitor their heart rates. So their heart rates are within a certain expected range. Um, and if anything is wrong, we pull the player out. Sometimes uh, the heart rate may go a bit faster than ex expected because uh, players are undergoing fatigue and all that. And sometimes it's good for us to monitor heart rates, uh, not only for safety, but also for performance levels. And uh, if, you, if you can manage in training as well uh, to monitor their lactate uh, in the blood, we take blood samples and then... Um, uh, uh, sort of uh, correlate that with the heart rate, then you know that a certain heart rate, you know, will be sort of more or less commensurate with a certain level of lactate, and that the player is is uh, is approaching uh, or has, of course, undergone uh, fatigue and should be taken out and replaced by another player. So for 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 you know technical and tactical considerations like that, also sometimes you wonder why certain players are taken out instead of this player that player, because they're monitoring. You see, they're monitoring the heart rate. And they know the correlation with the uh, lactic levels that they have done by testing them before and by uh, monitoring them in training. So I think I think uh, you know that that uh, scientific uh, moni and medical monitoring of of at least uh, not only for their health and safety but also for their performance I think should be uh, developed and adopted uh, not only by our national team but also by our state uh, professional teams because. Because when you want to be professional, I think you, you, you have to go the whole way, the whole hog, and not just go halfway and call yourself professional by paying uh, people money to play and to take the risk, but not doing uh, the, uh, you know, the whole range of proper things uh, to, uh, to prevent or to avoid any untoward incident. Okay? Mm -hmm. Mm, okay, okay. I mean, I totally agree with you. If you are doing something, it has to be across from top level all the way to elite level. Totally agree with you. Absolutely, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, guys. Any further question before we wrap it up? 
Uh, no, actually, for me, I just want to thank uh, Dr. Ramlan so much for coming on board our show, really uh, sharing all kinds of insights, your yeah. experience, <laughs> and uh, you know, especially in the medical line as well, you know, so ho- yep. hopefully our listeners are more well informed about the heart, especially now. Yeah, yeah. definitely, definitely. <laughs> yeah. You know, there is, is you know, uh, one more bit for me to, to mention. I'm sure after all of this, now it's, it's, it's been mentioned, you know, all over the place. After, after the initial uh, um, emergency ma- management and treatment and all that, I think that the next stage, um, in terms of the timing now, uh, once it's comfortable, so Christian Erickson really had to find out what was the cause of the cardiac arrest. Okay? So I think, I think that's, that's yeah. key to, to uh, what will happen and will be a big uh, lesson for, for the rest of the footballing world. Um, so sometimes these are the things that happen uh, for us to, to benefit from. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, some from from this particular dark cloud, the uh, silver lining of of learning new things that will benefit other players in the future. I think that's that's really wonderful uh, yeah. for us to to be doing this well. I it's been a pleasure for me to to be talking to you, um, uh, Bala, Steven, uh, Elvin, uh, tonight. Uh, all of you guys have been so so sweet in uh, tolerating my. My, uh, you know, my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's a thir- thirty-two-year-old train of thought I experienced. Yes, yes, yeah, yes. So, so, yeah. <laughs> well, so, sorry, something, sorry. something, something which I have to say. Most, most of us here are envy because you yeah. know to be to be in sports in that level is something magnificent. If you ask me, yeah. it's, it's it's been a blessing. I'm I'm truly thankful to the Almighty, yeah. um, because because you see you. you when, when, you, when you live your life, you have a certain sense of mission and all that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and you find a, a niche or, or a role that you play. But the one thing that I'm th- thankful is because I had an opportunity to serve uh, you know, uh, athletes and coaches and all that. It's not just about getting rewards and all that, which is, I think, would, uh, if, if anybody were to chase rewards, I think they would cheapen the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And then truly miss the meaning of, of uh, having a life uh, truly lived. So I think uh, the most important thing is for me at this point, once I've retired, of course, I'm, I'm not at the level I was, you know, when I was 32. <laughs> you know, I can't, I can't burn the candle both hands. I, uh, but, but at least I, I would be in a position and I look forward to, to continued uh, involvement to advise uh, my younger colleagues and, and, and guide them. Uh, I don't have all the answers, you know, and, and of course, as a human being, I'm not always right. But, but, if, but if I'm not right and uh, you feel I'm wrong, I would always welcome, uh, you know, uh, even a debate or, or some clarification of why you think I'm wrong. Why? Because I, 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 I do not know, need to know just that I'm wrong. I need to know why I'm wrong so that I can correct it, you see. So this is the reason why whenever somebody says, uh, differs with us in opinion. We need to ask, uh, we have an obligation to ask uh, the person who differs with us in opinion, why is it that they differ with us in opinion? And then if we agree with them, then we have to follow what they have, they have to say because that in itself is, 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 is uh, you know, you, you then influence the, the, the development of a proper culture that leads to uh, hopefully, hopefully a better level of, uh, you know, attainment of excellence because uh, if we are to, you know, put uh, put everything under the carpet, uh, you know, every rubbish under the carpet, you never learn anything. Like I said, you either win or you learn, so you never lose. Yeah. So there, it's been a pleasure, guys. Um, yeah, I think tonight we we got how many matches now? Um, we got well, that, uh, uh, as- shortly we have the Portugal Hungary. And uh-huh. also, not to forget, uh, we also have our uh, Harimau Malaya against Thailand. Oh, yes. That is, yeah. 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 And, Good. Uh, of course, at uh, 3 a.m., which is on uh, Wednesday morning, we'll have uh, the, the big one, Germany versus France. So, uh, we'll look forward to enjoying it. So, we're not sleeping sports. tonight, are we? No? <laughs> <laughs> we'll try. We'll try. We'll try. Football. Football <laughs> overload. <laughs> we're not sleeping tonight. Okay. There you go. Anyway, uh, Doctor, thank you so much. From all of us, on behalf of everybody from the Bola Bola Show, thank you for being with us and sharing all your, your knowledge and as well your experience in the field of sports medicine. And with that said, we would like to end this week's episode of the Bola Bola Show. Goodbye for now.